he, the Son of Man, will be delivered to the Gentiles and will be mocked and scourged and spit upon. In another Gospel we have these words, will be handed over to the hands of sinful men. These words we can transpose. The Lord in our day, more than in any day in the history of the Church, is handed over to the hands of sinful men. I happen to pick up in the course of this week a book which has influenced me actually quite a lot. This good lady who is being interviewed in it has since gone to her reward. Many of you will have heard of her. It's Maria Simma, an Austrian lady, there she is at the back there, you can just about see her, who gave her life as a victim for the souls in purgatory. And as a result of her offering and her suffering and her prayer, the Lord allowed that she be granted throughout her life, actually, a gift which is quite unique, knowing where souls went after their death. Hence it was that she was consulted by people all over the globe when dear ones died. And usually the answer was short and to the point, and more or less went in this direction, get a certain number, and the exact number was given of masses or stations of the cross or whatever it might be to help that person. But more details also could come through. And that's what makes this volume, which is an interview before she died, very interesting. It's the extra bits. And this good interviewer made a few pointed questions. It's Nikki Elts. Now, I just happened to come across something which was very relevant to, in fact, this very day. And you'll see why as I go along. Are there things that the poor souls have told you about regular masses today that they do not like and that make them unhappy? Oh yes, and there is so much of it too. The so-called sign of peace and the holding of hands during the Lord's Prayer are just two such things. They come right after the consecration and precisely while we ought to be concentrating on the Lord and on Him only. It is just then that He is closest to us and there people go looking around and searching for hands to grasp rather than being uninterrupted in the deepest prayer possible with Him, and not with one's often unfamiliar neighbour. This again is bringing social ritual into the church, rather than bringing Jesus more deeply to the people. I say often unfamiliar neighbour, because never let us put our guard down. She goes on to explain how people come into our assemblies who are involved in practices which makes even the touching of their hands actually not safe. People can be involved with all kinds of new age occult stuff and can be contaminated. And this element of holding hands, embracing, is not just neutral. And then there is, of course, clapping, which is the worst by far. Churches are for praying. Jesus is there in the tabernacle, and we take time off for applauding just another man for singing or doing something that happens to be popular, correct, or strong. This endangers the priest, or whoever said the popular thing, 
by lifting his ego rather than assisting him in his humbling mission of bringing Jesus to us. This is so wrong. And then she goes on about, they all held hands and clapped at school by young people. And we must show them that churches are only for them to meet with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Have the souls said anything about Eucharistic ministers? Yes. Under normal conditions, only the consecrated hands of priests may distribute communion. The law of the church states that this must be held to unless there are extraordinary circumstances. And she names one that the priest be bedridden. She goes on, extraordinary does not mean the difference between the congregation waiting two minutes to receive or waiting ten minutes. We must always prepare in prayer to receive Jesus, and people who insist on getting everything over as quickly as possible have no idea how enormous a privilege and source of graces and protection receiving our Jesus is for us. If anybody needs evidence that Eucharistic ministers, the way they are pushed today, are not within God's wishes, I can tell the following story about something that happened near here recently. Now listen to this. A woman who distributed communion and who led many other women to do the same died recently. I knew her briefly and heard a lot about her. Before the funeral, the casket was open for family and friends to say their goodbyes. Then, at a certain prearranged time, it was closed. But within less than an hour, notice that, less than an hour, a close relative arrived late and begged the priest in charge to please open it again briefly so that the loved one could also see the deceased as the others had. The priest agreed and with one or two other witnesses on hand lifted the cover and looked in. The small group saw something that was not the case just a very short time before. The woman's hands had turned pitch black. This was to me, as well as to others, God confirming to us that unconsecrated hands may not distribute Jesus at communion. Now, she goes on to say about the way that the documents of the church go in that direction and that she's actually correct because there has been a certain insistence from on high that it has to be a sufficient reason, e.g. several hundred people. To have these people coming up on a weekday is an abuse. On a weekday there is no need. Then there's the so-called people's water the inception of which also delighted Satan. Jesus is in the tabernacle. Listen to this. That should, and in capital letters this is put here, at all times be in the center of the church. By turning the altar around, it caused a series of things to happen. To begin with, the congregation's concentration upon Jesus was badly broken by now having the face of the priest in between. And the face is, of course, as anybody knows, the strongest point of communication between people. It is only, she says, during the homily that there should be this visual contact. And by the way, there should be visual contact at the homily. People who just read a sermon are missing part of the communication from soul to soul. I learned that very quickly in Italy. It's very important to look straight into the eyes. There should be a part of your soul passing into them, not just a reading of a script. That's 
the part that matters with regard to facial communication. The other, the second part of the celebration is fundamentally different in orientation. The priest, as a human being, does not exist. Now, I mention this on this day for this reason. Look behind me. This is the first time that we celebrate with the tabernacle put back where it should be. And this is the line that the Blessed Holy Father is taking. There are profound reasons for that. This house is our King's palace on earth, and his throne should be the central point where he sits and reigns over his people. To have a man's chair there is in some subtle way to filch the king's glory. And not only that, but the whole element of tampering with the liturgy, drawing attention to the person's own innovative quality, is again a filching from the rights of God. When we're in church, we do not exist. When we celebrate the worship of the church, we receive. We do not it's sufficiently powerful to go through the centuries without our help. God reigns in the liturgy and our function is to adore and to obey. To think that we can get it better than the church is the quintessence of spiritual pride. Do you see how offensive it is to the one that we're honouring? We, my friends, when we're in worship, are with the angels and the correct posture is Know this word bound, for there we are correctly what we are, nothing.